Hello, good evening and welcome to News at 10. And as always, on Wednesdays, it is The Stance. And uh, uh, we give the opportunity to our colleagues who uh, would then also be able to tell us how they covered the major stories of the week under review. And today we'll be touching base in the various regions to find out what the major stories there are and then also uh, what the latest information on those stories are. For now, though, let me give you the latest highlights regarding what's happening in Ghana and around the world before we delve deeper into our major stories. Now, two people, including a two-year-old baby boy, died in a fire outbreak caused by uh, an explosion of two gas tankers that were parked close to the Apremdo market in the Ifiakwesiminta municipality of the western region. A third victim, who was also caught in the fire, is receiving treatment at the Ifiankwanta Regional Hospital. Now, the Ghana M Medical Association is calling for a change in what it describes as the rumble style of picking patients, persons who are presumed to have contracted COVID-19 from their localities. According to the association, the scary nature of the process in itself could cause stigmatization uh, and persons infected by the virus may not want to come out to report. So the approach must be uh, looked at. And uh, still on issues regarding um, health, the outpatients department of the Adabraka Polyclinic in Accra currently records about 60 cases weekly compared to the average of 1,000 cases per week previously. The acting head of the facility, Dr. Razak Kwao, attributed the decline in the past few months to the COVID-19 pandemic. And a research, a research by microbiologists at the University of Development Studies has revealed that 50% of taps attached to 124 um, Veronica buckets sampled in Tamale were contaminated with microbes. Dr. Courage Saba is therefore advocating that hands-free hand washing systems be used to reduce the risk of contamination. The Inspector General of Police, IGP, James Opongbuenu, says the police service will support officers and their families who will be infected by COVID-19 in the line of duty. He gave the assurance ahead of a disinfection exercise at all 249 police facilities across the country as part of measures to curb the coronavirus spread. And uh, the four kingmakers of the Ikyapim traditional area who were arrested for flouting the ban on social gathering during the installation of the new Ukwapimhine have been fined a total of 48,000 CDs. The four, who were among other kingmakers, failed to comply with restrictions imposed in the Executive Instrument um, 164 and the Restrictions Act 2020. All right, so those are the stories making headlines locally. Let's find out what's happening around the world. And uh, we're starting from some news making rounds regarding what scientists have found about the coronavirus. All right, so the information is that the... Uh, I beg your pardon, just give me a moment. All right. All right, so uh, researchers in the United States and the United Kingdom have identified hundreds of mutations to the virus which causes the disease coronavirus or the COVID-19. But none has yet established what this will mean for virus spread in the population and for how effective a vaccine might be. Elsewhere around the world, the European Union is backing calls for a timely review of the international response to the coronavirus pandemic, including the World Health Organization's performance. The World Health Organization Director General Tenderos Adnom Gabriel Jesus has promised a review of its performance after the pandemic eases, including its independent oversight body. Now, Chancellor Angela Merkel has said Germans, uh, Germany's goal of solving the spread of the coronavirus has been achieved, so all shops 
can be reopened as lockdown restrictions are eased. Bundesliga football has been given the green light to resume and schools will gradually reopen in the summer term. Now, Venezuelan state television broadcast on Wednesday a video of captured American Luke Deman in which he said he was instructed to seize control of Caracas airport and bring in a plane to fly President Nicolas Maduro to the United States. Venezuelan authorities on Monday arrested Deman, another U.S. citizen Aaron Berry and 11 other terrorists in what Maduro has called a failed plot coordinated with Washington to enter the country via the Caribbean coast and oust him. So those are the major stories we have for you uh, by way of international stories. We will come back shortly with the major stories we have for you locally. All right, so we're going straight to our first story for the evening now. 49% of persons who have contracted COVID-19 in the Ashanti region are aged between 20 and 39. The Ashanti Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Emmanuel Tenkrang, says that they are going to be looking at these stories and the recent numbers that have come to them and uh, give a further look of some of the cases that they are expecting answer, results from. Region with 163 confirmed cases as at Monday, May 4th, comes second after the Greater Accra region. The youngest of the persons who have contracted COVID 19 in the region is 10 years old. The regional director of health, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkrain, noted the high infection rate among the youth should send a signal for all to continue to adhere to the safety protocols. The youth especially the male youth, they are very vibrant and their immune system is at its peak. They will always be able to uh, have very mild symptoms or even asymptomatic. That's the reason why people are having the impression as if the disease is not rare. You can be infected, you may not show any signs and symptoms, we call it asymptomatic. But the danger is that you will pass on the infection to somebody who is susceptible. Meanwhile, the Regional Health Directorate is collaborating with the Kumasi Centre for Collaborative Research, KCCR, to step up testing and release of results for early case management. Three additional laboratories at Kumasi South, Konfanochi Teaching Hospital and Hope Exchange Hospital will partake in testing of samples for real-time results. KCCR has so far tested about 41,986 samples. The region had recorded five deaths and 37 recoveries as at Monday, May 4th. All right, so uh, that is a story that was filed from the Ashanti region. We're staying in that region. Now we're going to be talking to William Evans Inkum, our Ashanti regional correspondent, to give us an update on this particular story. The surprising factor is that um, Dr. Tinkran said that um, out of the numbers they have, majority of which are between the ages of 20 and 39, they are persons who are likely to have shown no symptoms of the infection. And so how is it that they are able to, you know, keep these people in isolation so they do not go on to spread it, unknowing of the fact that they may be carrying it themselves? Uh, we've been joined by William Evans Inkum. William Evans Inkum, good evening and thank you for joining us from the Ashanti region. How is Osaikrom this evening? Well, Osaikrom is doing very well, despite the fact that we continue to have SAR in cases uh, as far as the COVID-19 is concerned. Nonetheless, I can say that the various administrative districts are also putting down stringent measures to ensure that at least uh, we do not cross a certain threshold which could be described as fatal. Martin. Right. Now, help us with um, the, the numbers in the region for now. We know that uh, KCCR, for instance, is expected to clear its backlog um, by end of week. From the current numbers we have, are you able to help us understand how and where these numbers have spread the most? Well, so um, in the last count, the Obwase um, remained the um, epicenter as far as cases in the Ashanti region is concerned. And 
my understanding is that Obuasi has crossed 40 um, and still remain epicenter. Kumasi Metro still remain epicenter when you're talking about Greater Kumasi. We are still waiting for the breakdown from the Ghana Health Service Directorate here in the Ashanti region. But if you take a look at the figures critically, um, you will understand that uh, in that particular story, it was also mentioned that 50% uh, of the youth or the cases are mostly found among the youth. Martin, I am not surprised because if you look at the 2010 census and the fact that 58% of the population that constitute the youth are all, be, or do, they all belong to the working class. And mm. we've said time with that number that the Shanti region um, has an informal based economy. So if you go to places like the Central Business District, that is where you find a chunk of the youth working. And that is exactly the place you also find people finding it difficult to adhere to the social distancing protocol. Mm. So if you could remember last week, the mayor, when he taught the CBD, mm. I mean, he came across um, uh, one who say people who were moving in droves and selling in droves and what have you. Mm. I'm talking about PZ. Um, he ordered for immediate shutdown of that particular place. Mm. Mandatory, I mean, testing was conducted and we are still waiting for the result. 310 um, samples were taken, but we're just hoping that tomorrow um, we should know the results. And that will inform the local authority as to whether to continue the mandatory testing mm. in the other market. We are talking about the Kumasi Central Market, which has a population of over 5,000. And of course, the Adum um, Enclave, which also has uh, a population of over 20,000. Mm. But Martin, I'm sure people wouldn't want to hear this, but we should be bracing ourselves for more positive cases as mm. far as the Ashanti region is concerned. Is it, and is that conclusion you've made based on the fact that people are not adhering to social distancing? You've just told us about the markets. Uh, paint a picture for us about persons who use public transport and people who go about their regular business. Are they, you know, adhering to the social distancing? And is it the reason why you're saying there is a likelihood that we are going to be having more positive cases? Absolutely. When it comes to the public transport, uh, especially those that are operating internally, I think there's, so, there's some level of control because I've come to uh, or I've, I've been to areas where I see police officers ensuring that the I mean, commercial vehicles do not go overboard. Mm. And I mean, there have also been other measures to ensure that they also do not, I mean, um, flout this simple directive. For instance, we, we know that the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly has come out with this unique status that will uh, ensure some future rotation for right. the various transport unions. We ha here we have 24 transport unions. So uh, what is going to happen is that in the near future, we are going to see a rotational system whereby not every commercial vehicles will be allowed to enter the central business district, irrespective of the fact that you still have your staker on on, on and all of that, mm -hmm. just like we are seeing within the central business district where the traders are running or operating a rotational system. Mm -hmm. um, so when you, when, when you talk about that aspect of the narrative, I can see that there's some level of control. What is becoming problematic is the cross-country uh, vehicles or, I mean, um, buses, mm -hmm. because still, apart from the state transport, there are other private coaches that still um, take the normal passengers. Uh, yes, of course, you intermittently see some of these passengers on their nose mask, but as to whether the nose mask alone is uh, enough to mm. stop the spread of the COVID, I think we will leave that to the health expert to um, say, I mean, to, to, to talk about that. But at least what we have been made to understand mm. is that social distancing is the best way of I mean, stopping or controlling the spread of the COVID. But when it comes to social in, I mean, distancing, as far as the inter-city coaches are concerned, mm. some of them still have problems, Martin. Mm. And, and finally, before you take leave of us, Evans, uh, let's explore the, the concept of 
enforcing the wearing of the masks and then also uh, enforcing the social distancing protocol that we all have been admonished to follow. What is the picture like in the Ashanti region? Do you have more people now wearing the mask at least? And then also, uh, what can you tell us about um, how people are adhering to the remaining protocols of uh, consistently washing their hands, not touching their face, etc.? I think I'll commend the Ghana Health Service Directorate here in the Ashanti region, the Kumasi Metro Health Committee, and of course the um, Ashanti Regional Coordinating Council, because they have ensured that people wear the nose mask. Now, what is happening is that they have placed the police at vantage position. So if you are entering the central business district, you are not on the nose mask. You are asked to go back. I've seen a number of instances where people were asked to go back and then um, 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 wear their nose mask. Somewhere, even a vehicle at a point in time, they, they were forced to disembark from the vehicle to go back and wear the nose mask. So if you enter the CBD, you see a num good number of people in their I mean, nose mask. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is with the central market where uh, people or the trade, some of the traders are still not adhering to the social distancing protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, enforcement by the security agencies, how are they managing it? Because certainly some people think that, well, um, freedom of movement, They're, they have their fundamental human rights. You don't, we saw videos of people say, you can't force me to cover my nostrils or my orifices. How is, how, how is it playing out between the security <laughs> agencies and the citizenry? Now, uh, believe, look, Ashanti region is a different environment. I mean, um, when it comes to people that a lot of people revere, that is a traditional authority. So I wasn't surprised to see the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly move with the Adum Hene and other traditional leaders to the central business district just for them to engage the traders and make them understand that look, we are all involved in this particular narrative and mm. we just want to ensure that this thing doesn't spread. Mm. So once it is coming from the traditional authority, then there's some level of adherence or I mean respect to that. But when it comes to when it is coming from the politician, mm. um, it doesn't carry so much weight. So um, I can tell you that now the traditional authority, at least from what I saw from the local authority, they are trying to put them, I mean, on the front line as far as campaign right. is concerned. And that's going to help. Thank you so much, uh, William Evans Inkum, for making time to speak with us this evening. Um, he is our Ashanti Regional Correspondent uh, helping us, uh, you know, understand what's happening in the Ashanti region, which is uh, the region with the second highest number of cases. This is still uh, News at 10 on TV3. On Wednesdays, it is The Stance, where we give the opportunity to our, our colleague journalists to uh, give us a background of some of the stories, the major stories that we've been covering for you. Uh, we stay on issues regarding health because the Ghana Medical Association is calling for a change in what it describes as the Rambo style of picking persons presumed to have con uh, contracted the coronavirus from their localities. According to the association, the scary nature of the process is the cause of stigmatization of persons infected by the virus even after treatment. Stigmatization has been one of the challenges in the fight against the COVID-19 in the country. Persons presumed to have contracted the virus are picked up from their residence amid sirens with an ambulance or a fleet of vehicles. This process, the association says, has been identified as a cause of the fear and panic among citizens, hence stigmatizing recovered patients. Until such a time that we have educated the public to the extent that people know that corona is like a flu. You can get it, you recover, and you don't have the ability to give it to anybody else again. We must find a way of picking people discreetly without making a public show of it. Aside this, the association also wants government to prioritize the prompt release of test results of healthcare workers and inpatients while enhancing preventive measures. You have situations where there's an exposure on the ward, they have taken their sample, then the whole ward is closed down or the whole unit is closed down, they are not taking new patients and they are waiting for sample uh, results to come. And these go and join that backlog of community samples. That is definitely not right. Reacting to hints of a possible lifting of restrictions on social gatherings by government, the Deputy General Secretary wondered the basis for that decision. 
has government convinced all of us in the community, in the scientific world, that the data suggests that they can lift that? Easing of some restrictions, everything should be backed by data and by the science. Now, if government has enough data to think that they want to do that, like I mentioned, we must change the way we do things. And that is, we cannot wait and just announce it that we have done it. A virologist, Dr. Eugene Sebastian Arthur, cautioned against any plans by government to lift restrictions on social gatherings now. According to him, there must be a strict enhancement of efforts already put in place to contain the spread of the virus. Until we get to that stage where people are comfortable with wearing of masks, okay, and knowing how to properly use them, I don't think it is in the right direction to lift the, uh, the, the restriction on social distancing and all that. I think these methods come together. So social distancing, um, the wearing of masks, with proper hand washing, with soap and running water, these go together. Okay, so if you are going to lift social distancing, you have to make sure that wearing of mask and hand washing is properly done and is done by everybody so that they are comfortable in doing them. This is still The Stands on TV3. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be taking a look at the education sector under the coronavirus. The e-learning platforms that have been provided, how are students able to, uh, you know, undertake or partake in those lectures? And then also, elsewhere around the world, uh, the country, some persons say government televised education program, they are unable to assess us. Two of my colleagues have covered stories in this regard. We'll be talking to them shortly. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is News at 10 on Wednesdays. It is The Stands. Let's uh, shift our attention to education now. There's been a lot of talk about online classes and the availability of e-learning platforms for students while school is uh, on hold. In communities where students have uh, to walk for miles away from their homes to access internet, Grace Hamwasari has been finding out how they have been coping. The closure of schools there's been a lot of talk about e-learning and online learning but here at Intuaso in the eastern region to find out how students are coping. Intuaso is a community near Adweju in the eastern region. Residents here are usually farmers, palm wine tappers and petty traders. Students here at all levels are at home because of the president's directive as part of measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. David and James are students of the Ntwasu SDA Basic School who explore the various television programs on education. If I switch on my TV, I go to home based TV. Home based TV. Oh, like a teacher and a student sit, and the teacher teach the students. So I watch it. James tells me the poor internet connectivity means one will have to walk for about 15 minutes to the roadside before a network can register on their phones. This is my phone and here there I don't get network so I walk out to get network to do what I need to do on my internet. When you say you walk out, where do you go? I'll, I'll mostly go to the roadside. Sarah has a faulty phone and the lack of electricity has rendered the Form 2 senior high school student helpless. She is waiting until her family connects to the national grid so she can join any of these talked about e-learning platforms. For now, we don't have light. And that the e-learning or the online learning is going on. I'm not involved because... We don't have light, so I don't know what is going on. A teacher in the community, William Opare, says apart from the lack of internet connectivity, parental support is also low. Some of the uh, the network, even if you want to make a call, mm -hmm. uh, you find it difficult uh, because uh, we don't have access to internet and then we don't also uh, have a place to even get the children to, you know, to teach. 
A female student of a tertiary institution is worried about the lack of negotiation between students and some educational facilities in the country on their upcoming examinations. Data is a problem. We don't always have money to buy airtime. Huh. And still, me for the e-learning there is not helping, so I don't, I don't even want to talk about it. Why not? Because we are not learning anything. Mm. We aren't learning. Sometimes even the lecture will come. <laughs> noise, uh, you will not hear anything. Then we, we, we will end up with chatting. Then that will be all. She doesn't know whether she can write exams or not due to the infrastructural difficulty. As long as these educational challenges, especially with internet connectivity, persist, students in some parts of the country will continue losing out on the much talked about online learning. And until these problems are solved, education in the country would never be as expected. Grace Hamwa Asare, TV3 News, in Tuaso, Eastern Region. And Grace has joined us via Skype to find out what exactly went into, you know, picking this story and then also that particular uh, town that you visited. Grace, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, you decided to pursue the story. What was the interest that, or what exactly were you looking for? So, Martin, thank you for having me. I took upon to do the story because I am a student myself. And then for those of us even in Accra, we were having challenges with the internet connecting to the lectures that we scheduled. You want to schedule the lecture in the morning so that by the evening you're ready for it and you log on and the connectivity is very bad. So mm. I was asking myself, if those of us in the country's capital are having these challenges, then what is happening to those who are not in the capital or those who are in other areas. Mm, and so right. we said that we're not even go very far away from the capital. We're going to Nsawum, which is also one of the busy communities or busy centers we have in the, in the country. So mm. Nsawum is not too far from Accra and Intuasu is also not too far from Nsawum. So right. that was where we went to find out how students there are coping. Mm. And like, like you heard in the story, it, it wasn't a pleasant um, outcome or feedback. Almost mm. most of them were not able to join. One of their kids told us that we have to walk 15 minutes from where they live mm -hmm. to the roadside before they can be able to connect to any class that they want to join. Mm. And I mean, walking from your house for 15 minutes to the roadside, you will be tired even before you get there for you to have that um, right frame of mind to be able to join the a class. Right. Yes, and, and, and others complained of no electricity mm. and the fact that really people didn't care. So they just couldn't join it. So th those were the major challenges. Does, were you able to tell whether it cut across from, you know, people in the lower um, uh, level of education through the secondary to the tertiary? Was it a problem that cut across, you know, these entire sectors? Yes, Martin. So the, the, if you, the plan of the story I did was from junior high schools, or I mean primary school students up to tertiary. So I spoke with somebody in primary school, and I think his name is Jacob. He said that he's been watching um, home-based TV because they have something like that there. They don't have the online platform, so right. he uses that. And then the person in junior high school, mm. also he had to work for 15 minutes before he's able to join a class. The lady in senior high school says she doesn't even have electricity, mm. so she doesn't know what is happening. Then the lady in tertiary said that they join the class all right, but the connection is so bad. The lecturer says a thing, don't hear anything, so they end up chatting mm. on the page, and when everybody's tired, they mm. all leave. So it's it cut across every level of education. Even the teacher who we spoke with yeah. also said the same thing. The parents who even have smartphones also don't even see the relevant of giving the phones to their mm. children to use because they are crying over data and the local mini credits and yeah, things. Yeah. So, yes, they, they and, it's interesting you mentioned that because I also have a few friends who say that whenever they log in during lectures, their attention span is low and they end up chatting with their colleagues. So it's interesting that it's not just you know an urban problem, but then elsewhere out of the major cities, they are encountering the same. What can you tell us about the teacher? What, what did he say else uh, regarding what they may be able to do 
to help the peoples? Did he mention? Yeah, so I asked him if they're doing anything to help the, the pupils who are home. And he said that they have tried um, on some occasions to organize classes for their students. But again, they don't have parental support. Mm. And they don't even have a place to do it because the community is a bit scattered. The students don't live too close to each other. And so where to even gather, where to find as a vantage point for everybody to gather is a problem. Mm -hmm. And then they are also saying that um, government says they have to be at home and they have to do social distancing. And mm -hmm. so they are finding excuses in that to say that we can't bring our children for you to gather them at a place for you to have a class. And so mm. all the options they have tried to um to look at having to work because the parents will not support and the students also see it as a field day we are mm -hmm. not in school government says you stay at home yeah. so why would you a teacher want to gather us and then come and say you want to teach us when we're supposed to be home as government has directed so it, it didn't really work right Grace, uh, we may have to leave it here for now, but certainly this is a conversation that will go on for some time. The telcos must also come in to see what they are doing to expand into those areas and, you know, make um, data available. But thank you very much, Grace Hamwa Asari, my colleague here at TV3, uh, bringing us uh, that story uh, having to do with the education front. That is e-learning. Now, government said that it had given an opportunity for almost everyone to be able to follow uh, classes on TV. We'll go elsewhere around the country to find out how persons living in very extreme rural areas are also coping. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is News at 10. We're going straight to that other education story we mentioned to you. The Ghana Education Service has been implementing the Ghana Learning TV as a virtual learning platform for senior high students. But students at Akwedria, um, Akwedru in the Busumtri district of the Ashanti region say they are yet to partake in the televised learning program. Correspondent Beatrice Biogabra has more in the story. We want to first speak to one who is in the SHS. Um, how are you? And since you came home, how have you been learning? We are Okay. And then our person come with the car, the mamma, most moot me, I show with TVs and seven years, a teacher, Nico Crow, Osha, Obet me at TS, a send our person come on, you know. Ah, the person come in and say, It be a winning car from one for the no mile from two, and some of my from three, and let me at TS more. If it's a mobile fee if it's much, no more payment down, me no work, I say. One can swash that for books, so we see idea. And then I also. Go on, Miss English or science. Now, who's your other teacher? And count how old they are. Miss Shadam Phil is a teacher. Miss Shadam Madian. Okay. Now, what's she? TV so the only bida. Eh, who? The extra or so no. Ah, old they are. Now, who should be crowded? Should be daddy by form one for the. Miss who so ma? Oh, my teacher form one for the. At times, form three for the. Now, I'm not sure. I say, I'm not form one for the. I'm not sure. But I say, form one for your school. You must check. In terms of any who experience your school, in terms of doing kind of form one, then everyone says I'm the form three for the number. I attend a Fijas Senior High School. Okay, which form are you? I'm form one. Form one. Uh, since you came home, how have you been learning? The last day, I learned um, geography. Geography. Is it the only subject you've been learning, or you vary it? I learned geography, science, and maths. How are you able to understand what is in your notebook or your textbook? I don't understand it well. What message do you have for the Minister of Education or the Ministry of Education concerning the subjects that they teach on the TV station? I would like to tell the Minister of Education that they should encourage the form ones so that we can learn well. They should put our subjects on the TV station. All right, so we are staying on this uh, subject matter also a uh, while longer. We've been joined uh, on Skype by Beatrice Spiogabra, who covered that story. And let me just say this quickly, that that story was first aired on the 1st of May 2020, 1st of May 2020. Let's go to Skype now and speak to Beatrice Spiogabra. Beatrice, good evening and thank you for joining us. Um, 
from the 1st of May up until now, can you tell us if there's been any improvement in um, the studies of these pupils that you spoke to? Good evening to you, Martin. I can say that nothing much has changed because the parents themselves were not so interested in asking their children to um, learn via TV because they themselves as parents were not even aware that something of that sort was happening on the TV channels that they can switch in and let their children study. And for the students themselves too, they, they are not so much interested in it. They prefer picking their and join their friends to go to one of one or two of the classrooms to learn on their own because they feel that what is being taught on the TV stations um, is not what they want to learn or they don't get the graphs of it when they watch the um, TV station to learn. So they would mm -hmm. rather go through their notebooks and their tests and the little that they can understand, they will take it like that. And I, um, from what I gathered from um, one of the pupils, you, or the students, I should say, that you spoke to, they said that they, um, did not, they were watching um, a, a class session that was for Form 3 uh, students and that he was a Form 1, so he didn't watch. What can you tell us about the timetables and the schedules of which class will be aired at what time? Were they able to tell you whether they had a, a timetable of a sort they were following? They, they themselves are not aware. In fact, we decided to go to that particular community because of the rural section of that nature. So we wanted to know if they are aware of such an opportunity for them to be learning via the television station. So until we went there, most of them didn't know. Just about one or two of them were aware that there was something like that on the TV station. But the first day that they tuned in, the subjects that were being taught was that of the those in SHS3. Mm -hmm. And since then, the motivation and the zeal to continue to watch again um, died off. And that is it for, for them. Mm. I, I'm sure you were able to interact with uh, at least some teachers uh, in that catchment area. What did they say about the situation? Did they have plans of maybe helping the students or enforcing that they take those classes on TV? or maybe there are extra plans of teaching them on the side. What did the teachers say? Well, I can't say we spoke to some teachers, but our interaction was with just the students and their parents. parents. Because we thought that parents, yes, if their children are at home, they should first be encouraging the students to, um, to learn. But the parents themselves were not even aware, as I've already said, so they told us that they are prompting and are telling them that they can tune into the TV station and let their children watch and learn, they will be doing that. But one particular woman said something that was very, very um, striking. She told us that the husband does not allow her to switch on the TV for the children at all. So it would be difficult for her to even um, tell the husband that they said they are doing some teaching on the TV station, so let me own the TV for our children to learn. So, um, she wanted us to wait for the husband to come from the farm and tell mm -hmm. him that they can tune in to the TV station for <laughs> the children's play. But obviously, we couldn't have waited for the husband to return from the mm -hmm. farm to tell them. That is the situation with those in the rural communities. But briefly, with the private schools that I've monitored and speaking to some parents in the Massey metropolis, the e-learning is going on very well for them, especially with those in the private schools. But there's been an extra cost to what they were being charged. For instance, one parent was telling me this afternoon that they've been asked to pay 150 Ghana cities. That is, it's pay and log in. If you don't pay, you can't let your children log in to learn. And when she questioned the school authorities as to why they have to charge them extra for their children to log on to learn, they said that is part of the decision taken by the school authorities to also get some amount of money to be paying their teachers. So, the e-learning, those who are taking part, especially in the private schools, have to incur some mm. additional costs if you want your children to log on to their, their system to take part in the um, classes. And the learning. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Beatrice Pio Gabra, for uh, giving us an update on how things are panning out there. She is uh, also our Ashanti regional correspondent. Well, it, it, hopefully in the coming days, we'll see how this pans out and how other communities uh, you know, taking the advantages or the opportunities that have been provided by state 
and then also some private uh, institutions to teach pupils who are home because I think that is one of the major concerns that a number of parents have raised. We will take a quick breather. When we return, we'll be talking about fall army worms. You would recall that in 2017, uh, Ghana had to battle these fall army worms that were destroying huge tracts of farmlands. We are told that they are back in the Ashanti region. We'll be taking a quick trip there uh, because uh, they have actually started destroying a number of farms. We'll give you details of that shortly. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Let's go straight to the agri sector now. And some maize farmers started experiencing a resurgence of fall armyworms uh, on their farms in the Ashanti region. Ibrahim Abubakar visited one of the affected farms and uh, has joined us via Skype to tell us actually what exactly the problem is, what he experienced, and then we'll compare that to what was happening in 2017 and then also whether or not government or, um, you know, the agri sector officials there in the Ashanti region have said anything about this current development. Ibrahim, good evening and thank you for joining us. Um, what can you, which exact farm did you go to and what did you see? Well, Martin, I went to a maize farm at Achiman in the Achiman Webija district. I decided to go to this farm because um, the owner of this farm suffered a great lot in 2017 when the fall army worm um, came into the country. In fact, he's one of, I would say, one of the first farmers who started experiencing um, these pests in his farm. I, I quite remember in 2017 when I went there, he called me that he had seen a new breed of pests in his farm. We went there, I had to move to the agri office to tell them this is what I found. They followed me to the farm. But when they got there, they were telling me it has nothing to do with a new pest. It's rather a stem borer. And they recommended some chemicals to him. He applied several times, but mm. um, it wasn't successful. It was then that we started to know that we have a new breed of um, armyworm in the country. So because he suffered a lot in 2017, I decided to go back and see what is happening currently. And Lo and behold, when I went there, in fact, the pests um, have invaded his farm. Mm. But fortunately, because of his past experience, mm -hmm. um, he has used some of the experience to be able to contain mm. the spread of the pest. So when I got there, they destroyed portion of the uh, maize farm, but he has been able to contain the spread of the pest. Right. And um, is his farm the only one that has been affected so far? Not at all. He, he told me a number of farmers have also been affected. I remember last week we went to Edra, you know, in Ashanti region, when we talk about Edra, it's the maize hub in the region. So we went to Edra with um, the Minister of Agri. And in fact, I saw a number of maize farmers who were complaining about the um, same invasion of the army worm. But this time around, the good news is that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has issued an alert mm. to the farmers because they've also observed that the um, pests are coming back. So they've issued an earlier alert mm. so that we wouldn't experience what we experienced in 2017. Mm. Um, it started in February, and by June, Ashanti region alone, over 63 hectares of mm. maize farm have been infected infested and most of the farmers had to abandon their farm. So this time round, um, we are seeing something different, which is very good. The mm -hmm. ministry is taking that initiative and what they are saying is that if you are a small scale farmer, a mm -hmm. um, small scale farmer, I mean a farmer who has between zero to five acres, you can easily go or walk to the nearest district office and go in for chemicals to contain the spread. It's free of charge, but if you have about five acres, then the only thing they can do for you is to come for advice. They will show you the chemicals that you have to use to ensure that it doesn't spread to mm. the, the other portion. And um, finally, and if you can be brief for us, the last time you went to the farm and as of uh, today that you're talking to us, can you say there has been an improvement in the containment of these fall army worms or they are still struggling in keeping it where, uh, where they started with the containment? 
Well, some farmers I spoke to are still struggling because they said they've walked to their Greek offices um, as said by the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, but they've not been given any chemical. But the, this particular farm that I visited, this morning I even spoke to the farmer and he told me that um, he has been able to contain it. But the fear is that, Martin, you know, we are now entering into the major farming season. Right. So the fear is that if the ministry does not come in quickly and help them to fight this pest, then we are likely to see what, what happened in 2017. And this um, probably is likely to affect our maize production in the country. Thank you so much, Ibrahim Abubakar, and um, for joining us to speak to us about that. Please do keep an eye on it for us. Ibrahim Abubakar, beautiful black star, Jesse there. And that's how we bring the bulletin to a close. I am Martin Esiedu Dati. Thank you very much for making time to watch. If you go to 3news.com, you'll see some more news over there. Do have a good evening, and as always, stay positive. Bye for now. Saying, Mayor, that day, Sambawami. But was it as simple as that?